Hey there guys, Paul here from TheEngineeringMindset.com. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at the controls of a chiller. Now the controls box is usually mounted to the chiller, and I've just highlighted it here on this illustration. A real controls panel will look something like this. So we've got the controller and various cables and wires going off all around the chiller and uh, it also allows remote control or remote access uh, via the BMS. Now on a real chiller you'll see all these cables and wires running all over the place from different parts all the way and uh, coming back into that control box. So we're going to have a look at what some of these cables are doing and how they're controlling the chiller. So why do we need the controls box on the chiller? Well the controls box is taking measurements from all over the machine these not only help control the machine, they also protect the machine in the event of any fault. These logs are usually kept for a certain amount of time in the machine or they can be externally recorded and these allow service engineers to diagnose the machine and make sure it's working as it should do, as it was designed. These logs may look something like this, obviously this is a static operation, there's nothing really happening here, um, but you can see you can go back a certain amount of time and you can, you can diagnose the machine from the display unit you can have a look at some of the alarms and the sets and the views as well. The display end will have you will let you look into the live data that's coming out of the chiller. You can see the various temperatures, pressures and, and states and the rated load amps, the lifts, etc. Even you can see this one is an alarm. So let's have a look at what some of these are. So first of all, we want to know how the chiller water and condenser water loops are behaving. So first, the chiller needs to know that there is water flowing in the evaporator and the condenser water loops. The chiller will not start, or should not start, if there is inadequate flow. This is to protect the chiller from freezing and bursting the heat exchanger tubes inside these, uh, these vessels. So the chiller will normally have flow sensors connected onto these which are feeding back to the control box. If adequate flow is detected, then the machine will be allowed to start. Then the chiller will need to know what the temperature is of the fluids of the, uh, the chilled water loop and also the condenser water loop. And that's going to be the flow and return temperatures on each. Next, we've got, we're going to want to know how the refrigerant is behaving. So the chiller will monitor the pressure of the evaporator and also the condenser. The chiller will then also want to measure the temperature of the refrigerant around the system. So it's going to measure the suction line temperature, also the discharge line temperature, and as well as the, uh, the liquid line temperature of the base there. Now from these temperature and pressure measurements of the refrigerant, you'll be able to plot on the chart the and the pressure enthalpy charts, how the chiller is performing with use of the uh, refrigerant tables and some interpolation of these. Now remember the chiller uses vane guides to control the capacity of the chiller. These vane guides change in position to meet the required cooling capacity. So the vane guide actuators need to be measured and also controlled. So we can add this control loop in as well. Now, the induction motor mounted on the back of the compressor is a vital component of the chiller. So obviously we're going to need to do some monitoring of this. So the control panel will also be measuring the temperature of the windings, indicated by the T here, the amount of amps being pulled by the motor per phase, as well as the voltage. If the voltage, current or temperature was to become too high, then the motor could burn out. So by monitoring these, the motor can protect itself. It can limit the amount of amps, and it can even shut the motor off if a serious fault was to occur, or preferably just before that would occur. Now there's another circuit which runs around the chiller, and this comes from this part here, which is the oil sump pump. The oil sump pump pushes lubricating oil around the machine, and it, it pushes this off into the gears and into the motor and this is to protect the motor and the gears. This lubricating oil 
stops the, the gears and the motor from overheating and, and basically stops it from eating itself. So for this system, the temperature and pressure of the, the lubrication circuit is also monitored. So almost all of these temperature, pressure, uh, measurement points around the chiller are all there, not only to run the machine, but also to protect itself from itself, basically. And there are a series of programs already built into it which will stop the machine running or raise awareness to the operator that the pressure and temperature etc has exceeded or fallen below uh, the threshold. It may even just stop the machine running so if there was high pressure then the, the, the chiller may trip on the high pressure and uh, cease to run for a certain amount of time. The controls part for the motor this will record also the run hours and the amount of starts. It may also record the run time since the last service. Most chillers can only start a certain amount of times per hour, especially these large ones, and that's to protect itself again. The inrush current into these motors is extremely large, so if the chiller was able to just turn on off, on off, on off, uh, you're going to blow all the circuits in the motor and also through your, your buzz bars in the control panels. And that will feed all the way back to your transformers, so you could blow your entire electrical circuit in your building. Now, I've just got a few screenshots here from uh, an actual chiller, just so you can see uh, what it looks like when it's actually recording this live data. Now all these points are measuring in uh, kilopascals for pressure and degrees Celsius for temperature. But you can see how it's measuring the temperatures of the different water loops. Uh, that it's detecting flow here. We've also got the voltage and the amps from the circuit on the uh, on the motor. And then we've got the various pressure and temperature sensors from the refrigerant around the system as well. This one is monitoring the, uh, the the oil pump temperatures and pressures, and also the motor winding temperatures as well. This one here, you can see the position of the vein guides. So this is currently at 19.2%. And this one here is recording how many hours the compressor has run for, and how many hours it has run since the last service. Okay, that is it for this video. Thank you very much for watching. If you want to stay tuned for more videos like this, and please hit the subscribe button. And if this video has helped you, then please like, and also hit the share button and give it to anyone uh, you think might help you, or them. Any questions, please leave them in the comments section down below. And don't forget to check out our website, theengineeringmindset.com. We're also on Facebook, Google, and Twitter.